Trans activist and model Munro Bergdorf was appointed the first ever LGBTQ campaigner for NSBCC's Childline until they suddenly severed their ties with her. Now, this decision sparked outrage, not just from her supporters, from LGBTQ people, but nearly 150 members of staff at the NSBCC signed a letter expressing their embarrassment and their shame at the charity's decision. Now, since the NSPCC have apologised and said that they want to build bridges with the LGBTQ community. But I wanted to sit down and chat to Munro about what it was like in the midst of that entire storm, the impact it's had on her personally, but also more broadly, what it's like being one of the most visible and high profile trans people in Britain during a time of rampant transphobia. Hey, Hello. how are you doing? I'm good. How Great to you? see you. Great to see you. <laughs> Great to see you. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are yeah. you? It's pretty nasty out there, isn't it? Yeah. In every sense. <laughs> I meant the weather, but perhaps <coughs> a metaphor for... Unfortunately. Before we talk about, ask about some of the negative, well, terrible negative experiences you've had, you've obviously become a bit of a phenomenon, I think it's fair to say. You're one of the most high profile, visible uh, trans people in, in Britain. What's that been like as an experience? I mean, do you often have people who are young and trans and coming mm. to t you know talk to you about what that means to have you out there? Oh my God, 100%. And like, it's amazing because I feel in some way I've been able to contribute to the um, sense of community and people, you know, especially trans teens can see themselves in me and can think, okay, you know what, I can do whatever I put my mind to because I sincerely think that we can if we all pull together and pull each other up. But also being exposed to the vitriol and the pushback and the backlash that constantly comes with every single thing that I do. If I've got a seat at the table in um, you know, an influential position, people will literally campaign against me until I'm forced to either leave or forced out and sacked or dropped. And I just find it a great shame because if you are going to be employing trans people and if you say that you want to help the community progress, then you need to be prepared for the backlash that you will get by employing trans people. Same with when, you know, back in the day when um, a gay um, person would be um, employed with a company, that company need to be prepared for the backlash and the shaming and the um, negativity that comes with um, standing behind homosexual people. Mm. Like, it's exactly the same. I don't think that you can take the good bits without being prepared to stand up against the bad bits. So before the most recent of events, could you give us a kind of flavour, uh, some examples, if you like, of some of the harassment you've, you've had to go through and what impact that has? I mean, the general consensus amongst these people are that um, I'm a danger or a threat to children, that essentially trans people are recruiting kids to become trans, that I am a bad role model, that I um, you know, I, 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 I feel really upset. Uh, of course, take your time. Like, I don't know, just like equating, like just sexualizing things. Like I will not be seen in the same way as a cisgender woman doing exactly the same thing as me. The fact that with this situation, I've been targeted and sexualized beyond my own sexualization. Mm -hmm. They've made it seem like I'm some sort of sexual deviant, that I've transitioned to fulfill a sexual fantasy. Mm -hmm. And equating children within that is probably one of the lowest things that you can do mm -hmm. as a human being. To say that I'm a sexual deviant and I shouldn't be allowed near children is disgusting. I mean, it strikes me there's a very profound echo here of section 28 in the which was introduced, the last piece of homophobic legislation introduced into, in Britain in, at the end of the 80s by Thatcher's government. And in practice, you know, it was all about, they're basically gay people, they're trying to recruit children. Mm -hmm. It's a subverse, it's, you know, they're deviants, they're trying to, you know, brainwash kids. Mm -hmm. They're trying to prey on kids. I mean, it's the same old tune. It's exactly played. the same thing. And because, you know, um, it seems that transphobia People don't, people can't wrap their head around it. They're like, oh, but you know, it's a legitimate opinion or it's freedom of speech. Your freedom of speech is not the same as abusing your freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't equate people to, um, you know, sexual predators 
a whole blanket demographic group of people like that's wild of course there's going to be predators within every single section of society but that's got nothing to do with the fact that we're trans you know it's almost like free reign at the moment it's like being trans in this country is like being a second class citizen time after time we're just seeing trans people harassed in defamation campaigns every single time that i do a public speaking um, gig they will turn up and they will ask me questions that are highly, highly, highly transphobic. And very vulnerable trans people come to my talks to feel empowered, to feel safe, to feel like, you know, they can see someone who's been through what they've gone through and come out the other side. And they're endangering those people, the emotional well-being of those people. You appointed Childline's first LGBTQ campaigner. Yes. Um, how did that feel when you were given that role and what what did you want to do with that role what, what did it mean to you in terms of how you'd go about it uh, first of all i was like really proud of myself and like proud of my community and the fact that um a uh, institution as iconic as childline i mean we all grew up with childline um, I thought, okay, well, this is progress. This is amazing. Um, I'm going to be able to reach so many kids with this. I'm going to, you know, let them know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. That is the only thing that I wanted to do. I'm not looking to change any kids. I'm not looking to influence any kids. I'm there to let kids, I was, well, I was there, to let kids know that this is a service that they can contact should they need it. That was my role. And um, I called my mom. My mom was so proud of me. That's been the most heartbreaking thing out of all of this is... Um, my parents seeing what's happening and they can't understand it for the life of them. They, they're just like, this is, this is bad. Can you explain the sequence of events then? What happened? Well, I mean, when it was announced, I could see like some kickback from the usual suspects on Twitter. And I was like, OK, well, I better call Childline and let them know that, you know, they may be getting some pushback and just prepare them. They were like, nope. Don't worry, we knew exactly what we were getting in for, um, asking you to come on board, and I was like, okay, great. And then I slept through the night, and then I woke up, and NSPCC had released a statement saying that um, they can't stand behind any statements made by um, any celebrities um, that are involved with their charity, and I will no longer be working with them, but not actually stating a reason why. Then I noticed that there was um, some trolling um, from a journalist called Janice Turner, who writes for The Times. And then I saw that she was calling me a porn model. And I was, I've never done porn in my life. Nude shoots, yes, for fashion magazines and a shoot for Playboy in which I spoke about um, my battles with um, self-harm, with growing up and having bad body image. So I used the platform as an empowering moment. Um, and I was like, but wait a minute, Abby Clancy and Melinda Massinger have both done shoots in the same way and of the same vein. And also the shoot that I did do for Playboy is nothing worse than anything that Lady Gaga or Beyonce or Britney or any pop star has done. No, I say, by the way, you looked, I, I thought those pictures were stunning. Oh, I mean, I I'm, I'm really um, happy with them. Yeah, that was not <laughs> porn by any definition. I've seen more explicit pictures in Paris advertising perfume on billboards. I mean, you could, um, you could, I mean, it was a silhouette. Yeah, it was literally, I mean, it, they, it was very tastefully done. It's quite artistic. Yeah. If people look at them, they, they, they will see how absurd that is. I mean, the NSPCC who operate the Childline helpline, they've adopted the pride flag. What are we supposed to make now of their role as a potential ally of struggling young LGBTQ people, particularly struggling trans people who are amongst those who need their help the most? What are we supposed to conclude? I mean, they're using our... Well, I mean, flag. I don't think it's that simple. I think the problem is a disconnect between management and the people on the ground that are doing great work with Childline. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really want to stress that the people that I worked with at Childline are doing an incredible job. And I'm going to urge people not to cancel their direct debits out of outrage because that just hurts the kids that mm -hmm. do contact Childline. So do not. And if you have cancelled your direct debit, then reinstate it. Um, but... The people that made this decision are not, you know, on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they're largely very conservative, very traditional. They just want to remove trans people 
from having a seat at the table, from having any form of influence. You know, I've been hounded or forced to leave or sacked from every single um, position of influence. It's happened before. This, I, I can't do this every five months. And people need to start realizing what's happening to me and what's been happening for years, because this is not my first scandal. And it's the same people doing it time and time again. And I'm tired and my community's tired because I'm not the only one going through it. Every single time one of my peers does a speak, um, speaking gig at a women's festival or you know an empowering, a momentous occasion, they are picketed, they are hounded and harassed consistently on social media. Those who call themselves feminists who are hounding you, I'm just trying to work out where throwing a black woman under a bus comes under feminism. This is a return to traditional values that there are two genders, that homosexuality is a sin, that um, you know LGBT queer people are a danger to children. What's the impact been on your mental health of all of this? I'm very vocal about my mental health. You know, I suffer from depression. It does make me worried about the long-term effects of having going through this every five months and having to, you know, be a pillar of strength. And, you know, I do think about, you know, what about when I'm older and all of this catches up with me? Like, what do I do? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of worried, like, for my safety as well. Like, where do these people stop? Um, my parents are worried about me. I'm, I'm worried like about you know, the fact that no one seems to be challenging this, the fact that it seems okay to be, um, you know, abusing trans people consistently. I mean, I get a lot of support because I'm more high profile, but this is not the case for the majority of trans people. They're just losing their jobs and that's that. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of no one speaking up for the black trans women that are murdered all the time. And the, you know, what, where was the um, people standing up for Naomi Hersey when she was stabbed in a hotel room? And then if, like, say, a white um, gay man is assaulted, it gets so much more press mm -hmm. than if a black trans woman is assaulted. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be outraged if a white gay man is assaulted. That's disgusting also. But we need the same outrage for our trans sisters and brothers and non-binary people. Mm -hmm. It's disproportionate and lives are being prioritised, and black trans women are on the bottom. I actually found that pretty upsetting, to be honest, and I'm also actually very angry about it, and I think we, we all should be. Um, it is just too reminiscent and too familiar of what uh, gay people have had to go through for so long. We know how history judged the way gay people were treated, and are still treated, not to be complacent, certainly when we have gay people and lesbians being beaten up in public. But it, it does show that we really do need to speak out about this, and we need to be allies. But I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear from trans people in particular about your experiences, um, about what we can all do to, to stand up to this, um, and where this is all going.